everyone and a very big thank you for joining us this evening. Um, we have a record number of registrations from all around the world, so wherever you are joining us, um, a very warm welcome to you this evening. My name is Katie Williams, I'm the Technical Manager at Denji, and I'm delighted to be joined by Emily Floyd and Lucy Grieve from Rossdale's Veterinary Surgeons, and they'll be discussing the veterinary care of the laminitic, both in an ambulatory setting as well as the hospital. The webinar is part of the Healthy Weight, Healthy Horse campaign, which is a collaboration between the Vet Partners Group and Denji, and it's been running all this spring. Um, the evening is being recorded and details of how to find it will be circulated um, in the coming days. There will be a Q&A session at the end, so please use the Q&A box. Um, if we don't get time to answer them tonight, if they're in the Q&A box, we can follow up. If you put them in the chat, we can't access them after this evening. Um, so. It is my pleasure to introduce Lucy and Emily. Lucy Grieve is an ambulatory vet at Rossdale's New Market. Um, after qualifying from Cambridge University in 2007, Lucy became the first intern for what was then the new diagnostic imaging internship at Rossdale's. And after completing this, she spent seven years as an in-house vet for Darley's pre-training facility in New Market. She returned to Rossdale's in 2015 and was also then the Equine Veterinary Association President for 2020-2021. And she has been a member of Beaver Council since 2012, serving as chair of the Ethics and Welfare Committee, as well as sitting on the Equestrian Sports Committee. Emily, Emily Floyd is a member of the internal medicine team at Rossdale's Equine Hospital and has a particular interest in equine neonatology. She joined Rossdale's in 2009, became a partner in 2016 and clinical director in 2021. And in 2012, she became an RCVS specialist in equine medicine, having been awarded and um, recognised specialist status by the RVC. She's also a diplomat of the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine, which she achieved during three years at the University of California's Veterinary Medical Teaching Hospital. Um, she's a number of research projects related to neonatal fall conditions and has published and lectured widely on the subject. So I'm delighted they're both with us. Um, we're extremely lucky to have you both. So thank you for giving up your evening and I will stop sharing and hand over to you to get us started. Hello everybody. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. So Emily and I are going to take turns talking in this um, webinar and we'll sort of present the, the background and the challenges and the hopefully some solutions to how we deal with these cases um, and we'll, we'll alternate between us talking through it. So I've, at the moment I can only see Kate's screen so we just need to try and work out. Emily might need to is it me or is it someone else? Everyone else got it? Or is it me that needs to change my viewing? Sorry, everybody. Uh, I I am sharing. Can you not see me? I can. Oh, that's better. Sorry. Yeah, I, can be. I, can, I can see you, Emily. Your um, your screen. I think. Sorry. Yeah. Try again, Emily. <laughs> Thank you for it. Okay. it might be the way I have my settings. Apologies. Is that, is that all right now? Yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah, now. Sorry, yeah, Emily. You might have to interrupt when I come to your slides. <laughs> Yeah, right. I'll just keep talking. You can keep going if you want, that's fine. Um, so introduction. So the introduction really to what we're going to talk about today um, is that laminitis is a very painful condition of the hoof. And I think it's really important that we recognise that. We hear the word laminitis banded around an awful lot in, in practice, on yards, between horse owners and people. And it's kind of sometimes considered this thing that kind of just happens and it's it's sad, but it happens. But actually, it's a really, really critical welfare issue to horses and we have to try and tackle it as such. It's reported that depending on what groups you're looking at, um, horses, ponies, breeds, etc. But the incidence of laminitis in a population can be anything from 1.5% up to 34%. So if you think about the, the top end there, you know, up to a third of some populations of horses suffer from laminitis, not just at risk, but suffer from laminitis. Um, so we um, have very different experiences between us. So I deal very much with the general horse population. I'm out and about doing routine work quite often, emergencies, whereas Emily's seeing the hospitalised referral population. So that we've got two very different experiences, which we're hopefully gonna, gonna bring to you today. And obviously there's a difference between ponies and horses. You know, when you think of laminitis, I think it's, it's common to think more of ponies, native breeds, um, but it's important to remember that horses can get it as well. 
Um, the big key factor about laminitis is that it's very much um, to do with concurrent disease and disease in the background. And when you've got other problems going on, laminitis can suddenly become even worse than if it were on its own. It's a very complex multifactorial disease. There's an awful lot going on. It's not just simply a condition of the hoof. It's involving the whole body system. It just manifests. It shows itself as a condition of the hoof. There's numerous different causes. So laminitis isn't actually a specific disease. It's actually a symptom of other diseases and, and how it presents and how sort of successfully you can treat these horses uh, and how successfully they might um, be, be be, be, be treated and, and resolved depends massively on those causes. It's still a very poorly understood, um, like pathology we call it, very poorly understood mechanism. Um, an awful lot of money and research has actually gone into laminitis throughout the world, um, but still there's a, a huge amount that we don't know. So we're very much still learning, but this is obviously a summary of what's most up to date and what we do know at this time. So, an introduction, you'll hear people talk about acute and chronic laminitis. Now that's because laminitis can happen for the first time in a very acute fashion, very severe, full-blown, obvious laminitis, or you can get these laminitics that seem to suffer either long-standing laminitis or recurrent episodes of, or bouts as we call them. There's definitely an increase in the risk of horses having to be put to sleep if, um, if a horse has laminitis. So six-fold increase over the general population. So that's a really quite a sobering statistic there if you think about it. So it's not just a condition that, that's often easily resolved, it can be fatal. We need to remember that. It can have debilitating long-term effects. So severe and chronic cases often result in changes within the hoof, which we'll talk about later that can end up necessitating euthanasia. So these horses don't often die on their own, and I think that's really important as well to remember. We often have to put them to sleep out of welfare because of the pain and the suffering that they're in. It's a really, really important disease and far too common um, than, than we'd like. Next slide, please, Emily, thank you. So what, I'm still on the right slides, aren't I, Emily? You're not taking over yet. <laughs> What is laminitis? So laminitis actually means, anything with an itis on the end tends to mean inflammation. And the lamina is a particular part of the hoof tissue. So it's inflammation of the lamina tissue within the foot. Now the lamina, if you look at that cross section of, um, of a post-mortem foot there, you can see all these very technical words for all these different layers and parts and bones and soft tissues. Um, the lamina is, is, as you can see in brackets, there's stratum and turnum. It's interdigitating layers, okay, of, of um, soft tissues that attach the inside of the hoof wall to the coffin bone, okay, so the distal phalanx. And it acts a little bit like Velcro. So those little sort of hooks and little sort of um, barbs, if you like, of the Velcro is what's holding your horse's hoof to the, to the bone within the hoof. Without that, the horse can literally sadly and it has happened walk out of its foot so the bone can come out of the hoof literally the hoof can come off thankfully we don't see that very often but that that is how important the laminar tissue is it's literally holding the horse's hooves on so the interconnecting lamina so this is probably a bit more detail than you'd want but it's just again to demonstrate how how sort of complex this part of the horse's foot is there's an awful lot of different layers, cells, blood supplies, nerves. And if you think about it, the difference with um, perhaps us and our feet is that if we get swollen toe or swollen, swollen foot, it swells and it can expand. We can sit, we can put our feet up, watch some telly, take drugs and let it get better. But with horses, they've caught, they're obviously constrained by this hoof wall capsule. They literally can't allow soft tissues within the foot to swell because there's nowhere for it to go. So the minute anything swells within the foot, i.e. the laminar tissue, as small and thin as that laminar tissue looks and as innocuous as it looks, if it starts to swell, it's got nowhere to go and it swells up within the capsule and causes pressure that can ultimately um, result in tissue dying. And that's why laminitis can often be so irreversible. If it gets to that stage, then tissues die and they simply can't regrow. So that just demonstrates really all the complex layers we have there. And if you look at these microscope slides, um, so somebody's taken laminar tissue and they've looked at it under a microscope with, with stains and things to identify the different types of cells there, 
you'll see the real difference. I think the reason we left this slide in um, is because you can see how fundamentally on a microscopic scale, a normal lamina, normal horse's lamina tissue looks really like, it's almost like little feathers. Can you see how those little feather-like structures look really sort of regular, really tightly fixed in their, in their sort of surrounding tissues? And then if you look at that laminitis um, electron microscope picture there, you can see that, or not electron microscope, big, big pardon, microscopy picture, you can see that those tissues have completely broken down. They're all sort of all over the place. Nothing's in straight lines anymore. There's no attachment, there's gaps. The whole lot looks quite mushed up by comparison. And that is the difficulty we're having. That can't go back to normal very easily, if at all, in many cases. And of course, as I mentioned, this is the only thing holding your horse's hoof capsule to the pedal bone inside its foot. So once this starts to go wrong, then you have got serious problems. Next slide, please. So when that does happen, when this laminar tissue gets damaged, if this progresses and gets worse and worse and worse, then you'll, you'll hear people talk about this, the pedal bone within the hoof can start to rotate. So what happens is the pedal bone is inside the hoof capsule, it's attached to the hoof wall here, that, that layer detaches and it starts to tip away down here with the horse's weight, purely mechanical stuff, gravity in the horse pushes the pedal bone down and away from the hoof wall. And you get this rotation as we call it, and you can get something called sinking, which is where the pedal bone hasn't just rotated on its axis, if you like, but it's also gone down. The whole column of bone has gone downwards. And you can end up, sadly, with the pedal bone coming through the sole of the foot. I, I'm glad to say I don't see cases like that very often, but I certainly remember it as kids. Um, we, we saw ponies that, that ended up in this kind of state purely because we didn't understand the disease as well as we do now. So thankfully, this stuff has normally been picked up before it gets to this stage. Next slide, please. So clinical signs, I think we are all familiar probably with the classical laminitic stance and the posture that these horses present in. And, and obviously if they've got to this stage, it's pretty severe. I wanna make that quite clear. This is severe laminitis, okay? It can happen quickly. So um, it's not to suggest that people have missed early warning signs because sometimes they can go from nothing to this, but often there are other warning signs in more gradual cases, particularly where there's more sort of underlying causes. So some things that people will often um, phone up and say when they're asking us to come and see their horses is that the horse is footy, sensitive, sort of difficult on the turn, doesn't like to turn on the hard ground particularly, uh, because it's obviously levering all those soft tissues that are very painful. Something that's more common in the more chronic, what we call subclinical laminitic, where maybe no one's actually picked up on the fact it's got laminitis and it's grumbling in the background, waiting to kind of tip over into a full blown acute stage, is that uh, these ponies and horses will be described as lazy. Um, he's very reluctant. I know, sadly, some older ponies um, have been sort of considered to be very good lead rein ponies and very safe first ponies because they're sort of very reluctant to take off at speed and very lazy and, and, and don't like to move too much. Of course, some of these ponies, sadly, have actually got subclinical laminitis. So laziness to the point where the horse is a bit pottery and stiff and not very willing to move could actually be a sign of laminitis. The classical sign that a lot of us would be thinking about is the increased digital pulses. So um, where you feel for pulses around the back of the fetlock region, just near where the feathers are and the, and the ergot, um, that's where you can feel the increased digital pulses. So the, the arteries are literally bounding blood into these inflamed, um, angry, painful tissues of the foot. And that increases the temperature of the feet as well. So you get palpable warmth and even heat sometimes, like really, really hot feet when you put your hand over the hoof walls. As I said before, reluctance to walk, they can rock back in this attempt to try and take the weight off the front of the feet where the lamina is at its most painful and most sensitive. They try and sort of stand on their heels. Um, some horses I've noticed even drag their bed up towards them and will try and create a sort of support for themselves. So it just shows you how, how sort of um, resilient they are really in trying to look after themselves. And often they'll start to lie down and things when it gets bad. But, but severe laminitics having a, a, a really, really bad episode sadly do almost come across like colics. I've certainly gone to laminitics where they're in such severe pain and distress. They are sweating, trembling, their heart rate is going through the roof. They don't know what to do with themselves. They kind of throw themselves around like a colic will. So the, the clinical signs are quite vast, but, but typically they are these, these foot related signs that we see here. 
next slide please thank you so here's some horses showing uh oh sorry same horse showing laminitic um sort of walk you see how sort of wooden in a way the horse is how reluctant it is to walk short stepping um and and not really you know wanting to take nice flowing normal strides it's taking shortened sort of wooden stiff strides and that's quite common of a horse and not always that easy to detect sometimes people think they're just stiff and maybe hurt themselves in other ways but this can be a sign of laminitis so clinical signs um so when you're looking and discussing with farriers these are things that they will often pick up on but if we look closely at the feet we can see them too so divergent growth rings is a known symptom of of particularly chronic laminitis, okay? So as the hoof is growing down, what happens is the front of the hoof wall um, won't grow as quickly because it's got a poor blood supply and an angry lamina as the heel end of the foot. So you get these growth rings that are actually diverging. So they're much narrower and closer together at the front and then they widen towards the heel. So that's a, that's a classic sign of, of ongoing chronic laminitis. Laminitics will also suffer things like poor hoof quality, same principle, their, their hoof and the, the tissues that grow the horn aren't getting as much blood supply and aren't as happy. You can get this convex sole, which tends to appear if the pedal bone started to sink or drop down, rotate towards the sole, and it will push the sole out to so get this doming appearance of the sole. And you can see that in chronic laminitics sometimes. And similarly, the white line, so the, the, the line around the edge of the foot of the hoof wall, when you lift it up, so the picture where the hoof testers are is a perfect example. Where the sole meets the wall, you'll see that there's this kind of widened area there. That's abnormal, okay? And that is what we call white line separation and can be a symptom of laminitis. And then another one which people don't always think about, but can sometimes um, occur to them when they look back in, into the horse's history, is recurrent foot abscesses. So the same problem, they've got poor feet, they've got gaps where they shouldn't have, they've got poor growth and poor blood supply. So they're really at risk of getting foot abscesses because bacteria, fungus, everything can live up into these little cracks. And, and with a poor blood supply course, the horse struggles to fight the infections themselves. So they can get recurrent abscesses for all those reasons. Next slide. So main causes of laminitis, we've got um, the biggest and most significant cause we come across, which is endocrine, okay? And by endocrine, we mean things that are affected by hormones in the body and such like. The most common one would be Cushing's, and we'll talk a bit about that in a minute, and we'll discuss that. There are other ones like equine metabolic syndrome, which you've probably heard of as well, largely relating all to insulin. So some of you would have come across this. Other causes of laminitis, which aren't related to those sort of hormone endocrine type issues, is a horse with severe sepsis. So that's where a horse has got a, a severe infection, um, can be through the gut, can be from um, generalized body sepsis. That can result in laminitis as well. So we do see some severely sick horses in the hospital that came in with one thing, like a horrible infection or a, uh, a bad foaling, things like that, develop sepsis, which causes a laminitis. And that's very different to the type that I see on the road, for instance. And then the other cause that we see is something called supporting limb laminitis, where a horse is standing for long periods with no weight on a limb. So let's say a horse with a severe fracture or a severe orthopedic condition of some sort, which prevents it weight bearing. The other leg is going to be taking way more weight than it should do. And eventually the lamina can take the strain of that and actually um, give way and, and, and develop laminitis. Hey, shall, I, shall I carry on, Luce? Up to you. Yeah. yeah, so I'm going to take on the next bit and we'll just talk a little bit about endocrine laminitis. And as Lucy said, that's by far the most common cause of laminitis that we see. And so, you know, you might occasionally be unlucky and has a have a horse that has a really severe problem related to lameness, for example, you know, a fracture or sepsis. And, you know, you may then get laminitis associated with those things. But 99% of the laminitis we see is caused by endocrine problems. And this is a, a bit of an oversimplification, but the vast majority of those of those cases are caused by abnormalities in insulin levels. Um, and so I'm going to break that down a bit further. And what are the causes of high insulin levels? So we talk about, you know, this high insulin being a really important causal factor for laminitis. And that's caused by two main things. So we firstly see it in horses that have Cushing's disease. And secondly, we see it in horses that have obesity or equine metabolic syndrome. And so that's the sort of joining link of these two things, that they are separate conditions and they occur in different horses. But the, the factor that's relevant to, to both of them is that they have abnormalities in the way that they regulate insulin 
and that has a direct impact on the chances of the horse getting laminitis. So we're just going to run through those two conditions separately because they're obviously very important to recognise. And you know, if you have one of these things, it, you know, it's important that we treat them to try and prevent laminitis developing. And the first one we think about is equine Cushing's disease. Um, and I still, you know, it's still much easier for most of us to call it Cushing's disease, although technically, you know, people will call it by its proper name, which is pars pituitary intermediate dysfunction or PPID. And Cushing's is actually a, a disease of the equine brain. And it's caused by degeneration of a tiny part of the base of the brain called the pituitary gland. And this part of the brain has some age related degeneration, which causes a loss of function of some specific neurons in the brain, which, which affects the messaging of certain hormones. And it basically causes the overproduction of a number of hormones. And the hormones that we see are things like um, adrenocorticotrophic hormone, ACTH. I mentioned that because it's important when we think about testing for this. Uh, ACTH also affects cortisol levels, and that affects some of the clinical signs we see. But there are also lots of other things, things like um, MSH. And the reason I mention that is because we see lots of things like hair abnormalities in horses with Cushing's. And they are directly caused by the overproduction of these hormones that come from the brain. So equine Cushing's is actually very common. It's, 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 it's basically an age-related disease. So there's very few really old horses that don't have a component of Cushing's disease. So we think it's common in horses that are greater than 20, possibly in as many as one in five horses will have Cushing's at that age. And it's actually quite rare in horses under 20. And certainly it's very rare in horses that are less than maybe 12, 13, 14 years of age. And that's important when we think about, you know, if you do have a horse with laminitis, think about whether or not it's actually relevant to test yours. If you have a 10 year old horse, it's actually quite unlikely that they will have Cushing's disease. And Cushing's usually progresses with increasing age. So we may see that a horse that's, you know, in their late twenties, you know, maybe if one year you're a little bit suspicious that maybe your horse is starting to have some signs of Cushing's, it doesn't really progress to anything. And then a, a year later, you're starting to see much more obvious signs and, you know, convincing clinical signs of Cushing's disease. So how do we recognize Cushing's disease? Well, obviously the first thing we think about is laminitis. And unfortunately that is sometimes the first clinical sign we see. And just like Lucy said, that's the thing that we're really trying to avoid because the, you know, the, the negative impact of that can be really, really great. We think about the really classic um, advanced clinical signs of Cushing's. It'd be this little hairy pony you see in the right. So a, a pony that's got really a long hair coat that fails to shed their hair coat in the, in the um, spring. We also see a loss of the top line. So this, these ponies start to get a bit pot belly. They get muscle wastage over their top line. They're often drinking excessively. So you may see that they're drinking more and peeing more. We get these specific fat deposits above the eyes. And some of these, these horses will also get sweaty. But just the same way, as Lucy said, with the clinical signs of laminitis per se, we also see these horses that have milder forms of the disease. So the most common early effect clinical signs we might see are a horse that's just underperforming, a bit lethargic, possibly a horse that's starting to have recurrent infections or other slightly unexplained clinical signs. How do we diagnose Cushing's disease? Well, generally it's quite easy to diagnose. And certainly if you have a horse that's you know, aged and really hairy, you almost don't need a test to, to diagnose it. You know, that's very classic of the disease. But it's, it's helpful to do blood tests to confirm the diagnosis. The simplest test that we do is a blood test to look for ACTH, which is that hormone I mentioned that um, is overproduced by the, by the horse's brain. And we're seeing these horses that have classic Cushing's, they have high levels of ACTH. So that's a, a good test in a horse that has clinical signs. If we have a horse that the clinical signs are a bit more vague, possibly a horse that's a little bit younger, then we will often do the second test, which we call a TRH stimulation test. And that's just basically the, the next level of test. It's slightly more accurate than a baseline test. And we will inject a, a certain substance into the horse. It's very safe. And we'll take two blood samples 10 minutes later. And what we see in these horses with Cushing's, they get an exaggerated response to this hormone. It's also a really good idea in these horses to check resting insulin concentration. You know, we've already said how important insulin is in the whole um, pathway of laminitis. So as well as checking ACTH, it's really helpful to check what the horse's baseline insulin concentration is. So the other disease that we commonly see, which is um, a cause of laminitis, is equine metabolic syndrome. And this is a slightly different form, but you know, again, like I said, the, the joining factor is the insulin. 
And in this condition, what we see is insulin dysregulation caused by obesity. And so this condition is basically the equivalent of human type two diabetes. So these horses that are having excessive fat, the fat is not inactive. You know, we tend to think about fat just being, you know, fat blobs that sit around, but actually this fat tissue um, secretes hormones. It can actually be quite active and it, it contributes to the horse's inability to regulate their insulin levels. And what, why do we get this? Well, the, the real answer why we get this is that horses have this design feature that actually, we think back to the original horses, these sort of native ponies, they were designed actually to be insulin resistant so they could store food. You know, a normal pony should be starved basically for you know, half the year. So they were designed in a system where they would um, you know, become sort of relatively insulin resistant through all, this, all the time of you know, goodness when there's lots of grass, they'd pile all the weight on. So they had fat stores for the winter, but then during the winter months when food was scarce, they'd lose all that weight again. And that would mean that their insulin regulation would go back to normal. And when we think about what we do for the horses that we love and care about, and you know, rightly so, that we do that, you know, we don't give these, these ponies and horses this period of starvation. So many of our ponies, you know, they're designed to be good doers, so they get fat very easily, but we're then not giving them this period of starvation, which helps them regulate their own insulin levels. How do we recognize it? Well, actually, generally, again, it's quite easy to recognize in as much as we will see excessive levels of fat in these horses. So the first thing can be a horse that's just generally overweight or possibly obese but we'll also see these very specific regional deposits of fat so you know some of these horses that are particularly prone to this condition may actually not be particularly fat over their whole body but they'll get these big fat deposits usually over the crest of their neck they'll get that really thick cresty neck that you see they'll get fat deposits over their shoulders over their rump and over their tail head and we certainly see that you know there are definite breeds that are predisposed we already talked about ponies um, but you know ponies donkeys arabs these are all the breeds that are really predisposed to developing this condition you know becoming excessively fat and developing these regional fat deposits so how do we diagnose it again we can do um, some simple blood tests and the starting point often is just to measure the horse's resting insulin concentration and if that is you know, not enough to give us the answer, what we will do is we'll do an oral sugar test. And what we're basically doing in that situation is we're challenging the horse's insulin response. So we're giving the horse a big slug of sugar, either in feed or syringing it into the horse's mouth. And then we are measuring how much insulin that horse makes in response to that sugar. And what we will see in these horses that have metabolic syndrome is they, make a, they have a very exaggerated insulin response to the administration of sugar. Just to touch on these things, I think it's useful to know about them. These are the other two things that Lucy mentioned already, the other cause of laminitis. And certainly as a hospital vet, these are the things that unfortunately I will probably contend with more often, certainly much more often than Lucy. And we'll see these horses that have really severe laminitis associated with an infection. And what happens in these, in these cases is that we get a primary infectious or sometimes just an inflammatory problem. So things like really bad colic or really bad diarrhea Retained placenta is a really common one in horses. And that inflammatory process causes the release of toxin in the horse's body, and they have a direct effect on the horse's hoof. And these cases can develop really severe laminitis, which are really difficult to treat. And you can imagine that when we're talking about some of the things we've talked about already, where we had this gradual buildup of um, you know, insulin dysregulation, for example, in these horses, they have a really acute process. It affects the laminae all in one go, and it can almost be that the, the hoof capsule just can't hold on to the foot that the inflammation is so severe. So these horses are very difficult to treat. The other one is this contralateral limb laminitis. And again, as Lucy already mentioned, this is where we get um, laminitis in the foot that is taking too much weight. So for example, a horse like you see here, that's had a fracture repair in one leg. If we have problems with a fracture repair and the horse is reluctant to stand on that leg, they put all their weight onto the other leg. And you can imagine over time that could cause overloading of that foot and, and lameness. And so what we really monitor these horses, and if, if you had a really lame horse at home, you know, hopefully that's not the case, but you, you can almost get tricked into thinking that the horse is getting better because they're starting to rest um, their other leg because they're actually getting pain in their you know, non-injured leg, which is a sign that they're having problems in it. Do you want to take over, Lucy? 
sorry, the mute button, of course. Um, diagnosis. So diagnosis of laminitis is often based on clinical presentation. So quite often when we get there, we see the horse and can immediately start to see that there's evidence there for laminitis. The lameness is often affecting two or more limbs. OK, so it's very common, I'd say, in my presentation, my, my sort of population horses I see to get the classic bilateral, which means left and right, four limb lameness. Emily may see um, in the more severe cases, maybe all four feet a bit more commonly and things like that. Um, they'll be doing this leaning back thing, taking the weight off the toes, the digital pulses, um, the warm feet. I'll quite often, if I'm not sure at this stage, um, because the symptoms aren't severe enough to be 100%, I might put some hoof testers on the foot, so the barrier restyle hoof testers in the picture. Uh, and often you'll find these horses are particularly sensitive just in front of the point of the frog. So between the toe and the point of the frog, which correlates with where that pedal bone is starting to, 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 to get close to the sole, okay? Then in some severe cases where you've got the sinking, which is where that pedal bone is not just rotated, but also sunk down in, you know, into the hoof capsule away from uh, where it should be, then you can find that the coronet band will be sort of depressed, okay? You can kind of push your fingers or thumbs sometimes down in between where the pastern and the coronet band meet. You can go down deeper than you should. That's not a good sign. That does always worry me if I feel that. That makes me think that the pedal bones have moved considerably to allow that to happen. And often they're sore in that area when you try that. Lying down more, reluctant to move. And then as I mentioned before, these sort of signs of pain, you know, the sweating, increased heart rate, increased breathing. They can get really depressed and really off their food as well. So, you know, it just shows you how, how severe this issue is for these horses. The next thing we might do, um, particularly when we've got very severe cases, in a subtle case, you might not do this immediately, but in a, in a, in a more mild to severe case, then I might be tempted to get um, down to the nitty gritty, which would be to take x-rays. And the reason x-rays are so important is because particularly if the horse has had a history of previous bouts of laminitis, we want to know where these pedal bones are because that really affects the prognosis. And when we say prognosis, we mean the chance of recovery. So when we're looking um, to x-ray the feet, we're looking to diagnose the, the laminitis. The classic thing, as I mentioned, is this movement of the pedal bone, so the rotation, which you can see in this top left image. So you can see that pedal bone should, that front bit, and you see this little line drawn on the front of the pedal bone, that should be parallel to those lines on the front of the hoof wall, okay? The, the two should be parallel. But if they have rotated, then obviously the pedal bone starts to look in that position, um, and obviously it can drop as well. So you're looking for, for changes in the position of the whole pedal bone and the past and everything going down to the foot. The other thing would be failure to respond to treatment. So some horses might be a little bit lame in front, a bit foot sore, but obviously laminitics tend to not get not come right very easily. So you might give some pain relief, etc. Um, you might even alter shoeing or trimming or do something that you, you obviously think might might help. But laminitics are often quite persistent in their pain and don't come, don't come sound or comfortable very easily. The x-rays will help you to prognosticate, as I mentioned before, which is to try and determine how severe the laminitis is and what are the chances of recovery. Once the pedal bone's moved, it is nigh on impossible to get that back into the correct shape because you can't physically move the pedal bone back up. If there's mild changes in the position of the pedal bone, farriers can sometimes encourage the new hoof to grow down in a more parallel fashion to the pedal bone, which can rectify some of the angles. But we're talking six to 12 months of, of sort of farriery to try and help that. And it won't be possible in severe case, more severe cases. But that's ultimately the other helpful thing about these x-rays is that the farriers are not then working blind. If you think about a farrier being asked to trim a laminitic, particularly a painful one, um, you know, they're really reluctant to cause any additional pain or cause more harm than good. So by just asking a farrier to trim your laminitic, it's quite hard for them to know where they should be removing hoof or leaving hoof or wherever. So x-rays are, are, are very much um, helpful for the farriers in terms of how they, they trim and shoe the feet going forwards. So in the acute stages, the pedal bone changes might not be noticeable, okay? And that's a really key thing to get across because quite often I'll be told, please, can you get the x-ray machine? Please, can you x-ray the laminitic? Um, but if it's only just happened, 
sometimes the x-rays might not have changed, if that makes sense. So sometimes the bone hasn't moved yet. If you x-ray too soon in some very first time acute cases, you might get a false sense of security because you'll think, oh, actually the penile bone's in the same place as it should be, that's fine, don't worry. But what can happen over the ensuing weeks is that can change. So there is sometimes a good reason why we might hold off x-ray in cases because we, until they're out of that really horrible acute stage sometimes, we don't know where those penile bones have ended up. So to be too early for rotation is, is, a, is, a, is a problem with the x-rays. And then that can sometimes mean you need to take serial x-rays. So it might be worth taking x-rays in the first week just to make sure that, you know, things haven't gone horrifically downhill. But you might then also repeat those x-rays a few weeks later when they're more comfortable to check that they haven't gone downhill in that period, if that makes sense. Next slide. Thank you. So when we look at the x-rays back at the clinic, we can't often do this at the yard, but we get an idea, obviously, as particularly if you've seen lots of laminitics before. But we'll take the x-rays back to the clinic. We'll get them up on the big diagnostic screens. We'll zoom in with them in this clever digital way. And we can use all these, um, these sort of tools on the digital x-rays now to look at angles. And there's quite a lot of research that's gone into which angles and measurements can be taken and doing clever formulas and ratios to work out prognosis. The long and the short of most of these things is the more rotation you've got, the worse the prognosis. Sinking, even worse for prognosis. So, I mean, there is, there is more sort of detail in the formulas and they're definitely worth doing in a lot of cases, but that is the broad brush um, that we're trying to, to determine when we take these x-rays and start measuring things. So on this x-ray, it's probably quite obvious, I hope, to some of you that this pedal bone, A, it looks a bit irregular and a bit funny, to be honest. It's probably had laminitis for some time and recurrent bouts. But also, can you see, if you look at that first green line to the far left, that's where the hoof wall um, lies on the x-ray, okay? If you then look at where that pedal bone is, the front of the pedal bone has swung way down uh, and diverged away from the hoop wall. And you can even see where the blue arrow indicates that where that pedal bone has moved and the lamina is dead and been torn, it's left a void, okay? And you end up with these gas shadows in these cases where there should be some soft tissues and happy lamina, there is now space. And that space ends up with, with, with gas in it, with, with air in it, essentially. And that's not a good thing, okay? That's not a good sign. That's often... Um, largely irreparable you will struggle severely to get that lamina to regrow it's torn the velcro is damaged the two pieces have come um, um, far far apart um, physically so the this is all bad news on an x-ray okay and then alongside that pedal bone rotation with the green uh, green lines you'll see the red ones that show that the where the, the bottom of the pedal bone the flat bottom of the pedal bone which should be sitting at a couple of degrees off um, parallel to the floor is now suddenly tipped right up like this. So basically the point of the pedal bone is, is pointing down into the sole. It's probably touching on the sole, which in itself bone on, on, on hoof, hoof sole is not good. Um, and then also the flexor tendons at the back of the leg are just constantly pulling it further and further in that direction. So you have this fighting a losing battle scenario once the lamina has lost its strength, if that makes sense. And then, oops, sorry. <laughs> there's just a little white arrow there just indicating the sinking thing. So to measure the sinking, we look at the distance between the top of the hoof wall where the coronet band is, and that's where that top of that white arrow is. And then we look at how far away the top of the pedal bone has dropped down. And we, we know what normal is for horses, and we can see if that's, that distance has increased, which would indicate sinking. And again, that's not good news. Next slide, please. Okay, so... I'm going to talk us through a bit about the treatment of acute laminitis and I have just divided this a little bit up into acute and, and chronic just because some of these things are more urgent when you see a horse that has those first signs of painful laminitis and Lucy's already highlighted this before but actually this is really urgent you know such a big problem you know you don't want to underestimate it you know you have a real wind of opportunity to act when you see any first you know initial signs of laminitis you know you can't ignore them you know you must get on and address them and these are the main things that we would think about doing to treat these horses the first is rest we think about foot support um, pain relief and then treating the underlying cause you know once we get through those acute management tools and we're just going to run through those briefly now so the first thing to do and I think if you're ever in the situation where you're not sure if your horse has laminitis 
then what you should absolutely do is to take them out of the pasture and to put them into a box and keep them on strict box rest until you can get some veterinary advice. And you, know, you really want to have them in a, a, you know, a nice uh, deep bed, which will support their frogs, give them some nice foot support. You can use sand that actually can be really nice if, if the sand's well drained. And you want to make sure that the, the bedding extends right up to the door. You know, we think about the way horses stand in the stable. There's no point spending loads and loads of money on bedding in that whole big expansive stable if the horse is standing on the concrete right at the front of the box. So that's the first and you know most urgent thing that we should do. If you've got any concerns, you're, you're recognizing laminitis, get the horse out of the pasture, get them onto a nice deep bed and where they're being rested. The next thing is soul support. And you know, Lucy's already talked a little bit about farriery. But in that acute phase, we often want to try and support the foot, but without doing anything too aggressive. You know, the foot's in a very fragile state when we have this acute laminitis. So we don't want to be necessarily hammering shoes onto these horses. We don't want to do anything too drastic, but we want to offer the, the horse some support through the sole, through the back of the sole where the, you know, we saw where we're trying to support the back of the heels, not where that pedal bone can be rotating. And there's lots of different ways that we can do that. We commonly use some of this foot putty, which you can mix together and it makes sort of a firm pad at the back of the foot. Or things like these cloud boots are really good and they, they have a nice soft pad inside which can make the horse a lot more comfortable. And they help transfer the load away from those painful laminae of the foot. Um, and as it, as it progresses, there are other things that we can do. Sometimes we use things like foot casts and different glue on or nail on shoes. But in that acute instance, if the horse needs more support than just a deep bed, we may do one of these things. I'm going to just mix up a, a little bit about some of the things that we do in the hospital that we can't do out and about, just so that you get the context of that. And if we have horses in the hospital that have really acute laminitis, which have really severe pain, it's difficult to control, we will often use this weight support sling. And what this does is it, it takes a proportion of the horse's weight. The horse can still lay down, actually, but it can take up to sort of 200 kilos of their body weight, which you can imagine if they're continuously bearing weight on these really painful feet, it can really help reduce the pain for that horse and also reduce some of the pressure and tension on the horse's um, feet and laminae. So this is something that we will do quite commonly in a horse that's got severe laminitis in the hospital. The next you know, really acute thing that we worry about is pain relief. And there's definitely a slight element of getting the balance right for this. We obviously want the horse to be as comfortable as possible, but equally we don't want to mask all signs of pain so that the horse then goes back to full work. You know, we, we want the horse to be comfortable, but still you know, just aware of their feet that you know, we're not then underestimating the scale of the problem. And the most common starting point for us, you know, for all that's really in this is, is to use um, standard pain relief like um, equipalazone or bute, which is also an anti-inflammatory. And there's other um, types of the same drug. So sometimes we use things like flinixin or thinidine sachets. And in horses that are particularly sensitive to bute or don't tolerate bute very well, we will sometimes use drugs like metacam. But fundamentally, these are all similar drugs. They're all basically types of ibuprofen that we can use in horses. Now, we do have to be a bit careful with them. If, if we're using high doses in horses or if we're using them for a prolonged period of times, we can see significant side effects. And the most common side effects that we see are um, in inflammation in the gastrointestinal tract, or we can see renal injury if we use them at really high doses. But for the most part, this will be the drugs that we'll start with. Because we're recognizing, you know, Lucy shows you all those, vid all those images of how complicated the foot is. You can imagine there's lots of different components causing pain in that foot. So some of it's related to the pressure, some of it's related to inflammation in the nerves, some of it's um, related just to inflammation in the laminae. And so for, for horses with bad laminitis, um, often, you know, just butte is not enough. And so in these horses, when they're at home, we will try adding in other medications. The main ones will use a paracetamol, which can actually be very useful um, to help control pain. And we'll also use gabapentin which is a drug which can combat nerve pain. And these tend to be the next two drugs that we add in. If you have a horse at home that has really severe laminitis, it's you know, still quite painful despite butte. If again, we have this horse in the hospital that have really severe laminitis, then we find this actually can be a real challenge to manage, even with all the drugs that we have in the world. And some of these horses need huge amounts of pain relief to even make them you know, reasonably comfortable. And we have a wide variety of options that we can use. We can use drugs like morphine or opioids, some of these horses, we can use sedatives. We'll even use things like infusions of ketamine. 
And you know, often these are things that are required to make the horse more comfortable. We also, in certain cases, can use local blocking. So sometimes we get a horse that has acute hind limb laminitis, where it's not actually as bad in the forelimbs. And in these horses, we can put epidural catheters in and, and administer pain relief directly um, around the nerve roots, applying the nerves to the hind limb. We can also sometimes block the feet. So you, you know, you may have, you know, just the same way that if you have a horse that's lame and your vet will put a nerve block in to try and identify if we are looking at the right area of the, the leg, you can block the nerves to the feet and that can give the horse temporary pain relief. And that can be particularly useful for horses that need the farrier, for example, that you can take away the pain in their feet temporarily to make that horse a bit more comfortable for the farrier to come or to have the feet x-rayed, for example. Um, cryotherapy is something else that we talk about, um, which is useful. And basically that just means icing the feet. And there's lots of evidence actually that continually icing the feet can be quite helpful at reducing inflammation, especially in the early stages of laminitis. And we also will use that preventatively. So say, for example, I were to admit a horse um, tomorrow that's um, a mare that's foaled recently, she's had a retained placenta, and I'm really worried that she's you know, at risk of having laminitis, then we will just ice that horse's feet straight away. And we'll you know, try to prevent the risk of the inflammation and those inflammatory markers getting to the feet and causing laminitis. And so this, this can be useful. It, it probably is mostly suited to the hospital because what we also don't want is we don't want shifts in temperature. So you, what you don't want to do is to heat the feet, you know, let get the feet nice and cold, then the ice melts and you're at work for, you know, eight hours, all that ice is melted and then you come back from work and then you put loads of ice back in and then you're you're causing fluctuations in blood flow. And that's, that's probably not that helpful. Actually, if you can't do it continuously, you're probably better not to do it at all. And so in an ideal world, we try and, Get the temperature below 10 degrees for about 72 hours which um, definitely can help and it can actually offer these horses some pain relief as well. One of the treatments I just wanted to mention and, and this is something that certainly um, we will use reasonably often is acetylin uh, which is a drug called ace acepromazine and this is a drug that's a vasodilator so it basically um, can help sort of alter blood supply to the foot but it also has another effect that it can have an effect on blood pressure. And some of these horses have really high blood pressure, mostly related to pain, and using this drug can help um, reduce that. And actually probably just as important is that actually it has quite good sedative properties. So if these horses are finding the box rest quite stressful, then actually the effect of sort of sedatives, anti-anxiety can also be useful. So once we get through that acute phase and we've hopefully controlled that acute pain, we then need to think a, a bit more about the longer term treatment of laminitis. And the first thing, obviously, is, is thinking about treating the underlying cause. We said already that, you know, 99% of the horses we see with laminitis have an underlying endocrine problem. So if we don't address that, we're not likely to get control of the laminitis and we're not likely to prevent it happening again. And then we're going to move on to this, these other things. So diet, which obviously Katie is going to talk to you about, um, you know, longer term, farriery, controlled return to exercise, and obviously, more importantly, how we prevent it. So how do we treat the underlying endocrine disease? So we think first about Cushing's disease, then the good thing is that we do have a very effective uh, medication that we can use for uh, Cushing's disease. And that's a drug called Pergolide, which um, most people use the brand Prosend. And this is a drug that basically will help normalize all those hormone levels that we talked about. Um, and actually, in most horses, it works quite well. In some horses, they need to have you know, a, a higher dose. And in some horses, it doesn't control all the effects. But in the vast majority of horses, it will control the majority of symptoms that you're seeing. And again, when we're doing that, we don't want to focus just on the medication. We want to make sure the horse's diet is correct. And again, Katie's going to talk about that. And we also want to think about you know, good preventative medicine. You know, some of these horses are a bit immune suppressed. They are you know, more likely to have other problems and so making sure that they are well wormed, that you know, you're just keeping on top of their preventative health care. So what about if you have a horse with metabolic syndrome? Well, the answer is this is quite difficult. You know, this is the same as um, the fact it's quite difficult to diet yourself. Actually, if you have a horse with equine metabolic syndrome, the real focus of management has to be trying to reduce um, the horse being overweight. And you know, this is the reason why we run things like weight clinics and trying to raise awareness. You know, Beaver have had a really big campaign this year about weight loss. And it's really about trying to focus on reducing your horse's weight, getting your horse back to a healthy weight, and that will help normalize the horse's insulin levels. So 
when we're thinking about that, you know, target weight loss is probably about half to 1% of body weight a week. Um, so, you know, again, Katie will talk again about diet, but that's the sort of target weight loss that we're thinking about. And we're also, to help us along with that, exercise is also pretty useful. So having an improved weight will improve your insulin sensitivity, but ex exercise also can obviously help with weight loss, but it also has its own effect in improving insulin sensitivity, same as in people. And obviously this depends on if your horse has acute laminitis. If your horse has acute laminitis, obviously they can't be exercised and, and that's one of those things that we have to accept. But actually in a horse that is at risk of laminitis and, and is overweight, you know, we really should use exercise as a tool to try and encourage weight loss. And the reasons I put these, these recommendations out there is I think that the same as we all like to be a bit um, optimistic about how much work we do when we go to the gym or go for a run, that actually if you're trying to really encourage weight loss in your horse, you actually have to work the horse quite hard. So these would be the general guidelines that we would give that if you are trying to you know, encourage weight loss in a horse that doesn't have active, you know, doesn't have laminitis, moderate intensity of exercise would be trying to get that horse's heart rate to sort of 130 to 170 beats per minute. That's a good fast canter for 30 minutes, five times a week. So that's quite a commitment. If you have a horse that's recovered from laminitis, but you know is now sound and, and getting back in work, you want to be a bit less aggressive. You obviously want to be very careful, monitor them as, as you're going through this exercise and build up to it. But you can get away with slightly lower intensive exercise and making sure it's on a soft surface. So the heart rate target would be a bit lower and you certainly can get um, heart rate monitors now, which you can use if you're really committed to this. And again, you want to be trying to exercise that horse for about 30 minutes, you know, three times a week and building up. And you know, to achieve those sorts of heart rates, you're thinking about trying to get the horse into a fast trot. And this exercise can be done, done obviously under saddle or you know, on the lunge or in any other forms of exercise. And when we think about metabolic syndrome, you know, they have to be the main aim that you have to be focused on trying to reduce weight, you know, and trying to improve exercise if you can. But there are occasions when these things are difficult. Obviously, if we have the horse as acute laminitis, you know, it's difficult to get them to lose weight in that acute phase. And we may need some medications to help us in the short term. But we really should be viewing those medications as a sort of short term plaster rather than a long term fix. And there's three main drugs that we will use. Um, the first one is a drug called metformin. That's a drug which basically improves insulin sensitivity on you know, food as it's absorbed. The second is a sort of newer drug that we're just learning about now. It's a drug called vilagliflozin. And again, that has a direct effect on insulin sensitivity. And these drugs can be helpful in a horse where we know their insulin levels are really high and we're finding it difficult to, to you know, get weight loss and the horse is still suffering from active laminitis. The final one is a drug called levothyroxine. That's basically a thyroid hormone. Now, it's, it's basically a myth that laminitis is ever really caused by hypothyroidism. That doesn't happen in horses at all, actually. But sometimes we can use this as a, basically a diet pill. So um, levothyroxine can increase metabolic rate. So in a horse that can't exercise, we can basically use this as kind of a cheat to try and increase the horse's metabolic rate and encourage weight loss in a horse that can't exercise. And that's obviously, again, only so suitable for the short term. OK, Lucy, do you want to just finish off? So farriery wise, long, longer term, as Emily's mentioned, in the acute stages, um, often it's really important to get things like soul support, deep bedding, all those other things in place. Um, but going forwards or with the more subtle cases, um, farriery from the home end, certainly, the, you know, the end that I'm dealing with people's yards is really important because I think some of the worst most difficult to treat cases I've seen, despite all our medical efforts and our diagnostic efforts, are ones where the foot shape has actually become so flat and the horse's toes so long that no matter how much we treat the kind of um, body system side of things, the endocrine side of things, their, their lamina never heals or they certainly can't seem to grow a healthy hoof wall and a healthy lamina underneath over time because the toes are levering the lamina away all the time. So that picture up at A, if you imagine that toe is a little bit too long, as the horse is walking, you'll see that it's pushing um, forces into the hoof wall and the lamina and levering the lamina away. So those cases that don't seem to recover well, despite everything appearing to be good from the veterinary side of things and the bloods and the, and the medicines, 
are sometimes um, mechanics. And so I just want to emphasize that because those are the frustrating ones that sometimes I wish we dealt with the Ferrari side a lot quicker. So I always look at that quite early on when I'm dealing with laminitics and it's really important that vets and farriers work together. So using x-rays to guide the trimming is key. Um, trying to restore this alignment of the pedal bone parallel to the hoof wall. So if you look at the bottom right image, you'll see that you, you know, you're never going to move the bone. You can't move the bone, but you can um, trim the hoof as it grows. And you have to do it over time. We're talking months, you know, and sometimes the trimming has to happen a tiny amount every couple, sort of two or three weeks. So you do need someone to have your farrier come in quite often. But you can slowly over time sort of encourage the hoof wall shape to change as it grows and encourage the sort of mechanical forces to improve in such a way that the correct alignment might eventually be restored, but it is very difficult to do in severe cases, much easier in the milder case, hence the importance of spotting these things early. Um, but the long and short I tend to have with any laminate or anything that might be prone to laminitis, short toes, rolled toes, things like that, no flare of the walls is all really important to avoid. Next slide, please. And then when it comes to prognosis, I kind of covered this already, so I won't go through it all again. But, you know, as I mentioned, number of feet affected, you know, how severe this laminitis bout was, how many bouts we've had previously. You know, does the horse respond quickly to the medication? Have we got this concurrent disease stuff under control? Um, but, you know, ultimately, if the pedal bone is rotated or sunk um, and those, you know, those degrees mentioned there, the distances mentioned there, are things that are cited in the research as being critical points at which, you know, realistically, you've reached a point of no return. And um, it's better that we um, identify those cases early with x-ray, et cetera, and being honest in our conversations. And we don't put those horses through prolonged periods of suffering where there really isn't much hope. And clearly, if you've got the pedal bone coming out the sole, that's sort of game over, sadly. There's, there's not an awful lot you're gonna be able to do about that. One thing I will say, bar the farriery, <laughs> is that the body weight of the horse from not just the point of the laminitis occurring, but through its recovery and its, and its health thereafter is really critical. So heavy horses, big heavy horses do much less well um, if that's a bit of a, an oxymoron there, but you know what I mean? They, they don't do as well as light horses, slimmer horses um, and ponies because they tend to just through mechanics have less force going through those feet and they have a better chance of not upsetting that process during recovery. Yeah. Next slide. And then the management going forward, you can't just say, oh, my horse has recovered from laminitis. It's Cushing's is under control or I've lost weight, um, it, you know, it's all, it's all going well now. Um, because it can be very easy to, to think that you're out the woods. And I will say this with a hand on my heart that I have seen cases where we've battled for a few months and we've got things under control. And sadly, um, the owner sometimes thinks, oh, you know, he's looking so well, he's looking so sad, I'm gonna turn him out, it's a lovely sunny day. And then the horse canters across the field and has an acute episode of where the, the feet suddenly are, are no longer viable. And um, we have had to put horses down in those situations. So I emphasize the point that you have to accept the recovery is long, it's very gradual, and absolutely don't rush any stages. Don't assume the horse looks fine, therefore it must be, because there's an awful lot of regrowth and, and, and firming up and strengthening that needs to occur. I often start these horses back with very controlled exercise before I even consider turning them out, letting them go across the field. I'll try and keep them on soft surfaces to reduce concussion. I'll often put them out for short periods, um, multiple times a day, and use sedlins to keep them nice and quiet and calm. And then you increasingly uh, in, increase that time of turnout or exercise. Um, and then when you are at the stage where you're able to put the horse out, it's had a bit of controlled walking. Um, then we tend to put them into a very small pen, sort of like the round pen size, then progress to sort of using electric fencing quite often, small paddocks and increase that size up back up to a large paddock. But just don't expect too much too soon. I, I really have the, the most depressing cases I've come across, the ones where everyone thought we're out the woods and, and have just kind of gone back to normal management and it's just not been the case. So x-rays are helpful, all your blood tests and your treatments are helpful, but nothing is a crystal ball. You have to always play it safe with these cases. And there's our risk factors for laminitis. So not wanting to frighten anyone, but there's quite a lot there. So, um, you know, being a mare is a risk factor, spring, summer months because of the increase in grass and sugar, 
increasing age, largely because of Cushing's and things, ponies, breed. We know there's a lot of genetics going on in the background for most of these other conditions, particularly um, equine metabolic syndrome is probably very, very breed related, genetic related. Endotoxemia, as Emily's mentioned, and then the really big one that I think I have to say, Cushing's aside, is obesity. I think that's the, the biggest cause of laminitis that I see out in my, in my job day to day. So preventing it, obviously have a look at your horse. Does your horse fit any of these categories? Is your horse at risk? Be honest with yourself, get some friendly advice from somebody that knows what they're talking about. Is he a bit on the porky side? Are those toes a bit long? You know, are there things that we should be keeping an eye out for? Have we got some subtle signs of Cushing's? Should, you know, is it in the age category? Maybe it's just worth testing for it. Um, you know, keeping, keeping all your kind of, the bits you can control, the weight management, such like the diet, you know, we can control those things. So really try your hardest. If you've got those typical breeds, typical body types, um, and, and typical age category of horse to try and manage all the bits that you can try and do to minimize laminitis risk. And then clearly, if you have a condition that might be associated with sepsis, for instance, then just be prepared for it. And like Emily said, there are prophylactic things we can do if we're worried about it. We're done. I don't know, Katie, do you want to questions now? Do you want to move on to you and then come back to me at the end? Um, well, I was going to ask one question, if that's all right, while we change over. There are some questions in the in the box, so if you'd rather have a bit of time to look at them behind the scenes and then we can do them at the end, it's entirely up to you. Um, or we can cover some off now, whichever you prefer, because they're mainly for you. <laughs> um, I mean, I don't mind, I can go through some in the box if you want. If you want to get started, we come back to them at the end, whatever suits you. Okay, thank you. Um, I was just going to ask, actually, in terms of the process between determining whether you're going to hospitalise a, a horse or pony with laminitis, what, how long would you leave it um, you know, out at home before deciding to take it to the hospital? Do you want me to answer that, Lucy, or do you want to? Yeah, well, I could certainly, maybe from my point of view, because yours would be interesting. Mm. I mean, I... Once they're, if they're in a really bad state, if I'm honest, I'm not going to travel them. <laughs> no. so, so quite often, if they've got to the stage where they're really severe, I, we have to deal with them at home. Travelling would be the worst thing to do. Uh, the, the ones where I might be referring them in would be the recurrent cases that we haven't got on top of or we haven't diagnosed um, Cushing's or, or EMS um, sufficiently to know why this horse is still suffering. Then I might say, Emily, can I get this horse into you? Can we, can we get... Or, or a horse that maybe actually... Is, is really struggling with weight loss actually we do admit horses don't be to the hospital for sort of weight loss um camps <laughs> boot yeah. camps um so they're the ones that would be sent in from my side but emily you would see a different population probably as well which are the ones that go down when i'm not in the hospital yeah i think the other thing actually i said it's really important that again if you if you have a horse that has something bad like a retained placenta or any of those things that you think is at risk of laminitis and they're the horse that get really severe laminitis very quickly you have a real window opportunity then to send them before they're really lame and actually there's a lot of things that we can do preventatively and once those horses get severe acute laminitis in four limbs then many of them don't survive sadly so if, if we're in that situation where there's one of these other risk factors and we're seeing the early signs then actually that's probably the window when we would try and get them into hospital so we can give that extra care that's hard to give at home. Yeah, I was fascinated seeing the slings because I could imagine that's going to be a, a huge tool for some individuals that are in a lot of pain and weight bearing and things, taking that load off. So it's, um, I, you can't replicate that at home, can you? So it's, um, it's a great thing to have in the hospital when needed. Um, there are lots of questions coming in, so shall we do some now while we're in the, in the flow? <laughs> sure. um, if, I, if you're happy, I'll read them out. And then one, the first one that came in actually was, have you heard of many cases that, um, of horses and ponies developing laminitis after their annual vaccination was given? Um, I think this person had an experience of two years running it happening within hours. I'm, I obviously vaccinate horses day in, day out, which is kind of the bread and butter of my job. And I can say I've not seen a single case. So I'm going to assume they are very rare. I certainly haven't heard of them. My, my inkling would be that actually the horse might have another underlying cause. 
that the stress of vaccination, and I don't mean like the literal stress of it, like the psychological stress necessarily, or that could be a factor, but maybe the body reacting to the vaccine is enough to kind of tip it over into some sort of lamnitic episode. Emily, what would your thoughts? Yeah, be? I would agree. I think, it was it, did it say an Arab? It was an Arab, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I would guess that that's, that the, that's a horse that's living right on the edge of, yeah. you know, having an endocrine dysfunction and that actually, you know, vaccines can be slightly inflammatory. So I would think that might have just been enough to tip the horse into, you know, an active signs of laminitis. I'd be looking yeah. for another cause, yeah. I'd be investigating that horse for another potential cause of laminitis, whether that's an insulin problem um, or Cushing, something like that, depending on its age, for instance. Mm. And that was sort of one of my questions, is that we get a lot of um, horse owners talking about the fact that or describing their horses as footy, in inverted commas. Mm. Now, from your point of view, or from what I would um, um, understand that to mean that you know, you've already got clinical signs pretty much apparent because there's a lameness there. So um, are you, does it make you concerned if people just do their own thing, kind of staple them, take them off the grass and sort of manage it themselves? Or if they've got that far, do you think a vet's required to sort of help um, deal with the issue? Emily, do you want to answer that? Or? Um... I just, it almost feels like because they've got that far that they're actually enough to be lame or footy or sore footed that you want some veterinary involvement. But I, I don't know whether you feel if people know their animals well enough, that's that's fine, or whether it usually inevitably progresses to something worse or more serious. Yeah, I think I think it's really really important that people react. You know, because sometimes it's difficult mm. that you're not sure. So I think it's really important that people take the initiative and react and take those first steps. But I think if you have a you know have a horse that's still footy then I you know it really you should seek veterinary you know attention because just like Lucy's saying actually you know some of these poor like little show ponies that are the best show ponies that get passed around and then you know you actually get them slim and sort the lemon ice out and then no one can ride them because they, they feel so good so I think actually sometimes you know it's easy to underestimate when you're dealing with it day in day out so sometimes it's just a fresh pair of eyes isn't it that's helpful I think it's yeah. key to remember it's not normal to get recurrent laminitic bouts. This is not a normal situation yeah. to be in. There's something mm -hmm. going on. And I think I do come across that every now and again, a client that maybe no one at the practice has seen for a few years, and they'll say, oh, yeah, he's fine. He's had about 10 bouts laminitis. I just pull him <laughs> off the grass for a few days and he's fine. But you're thinking there's, there's something going on. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's not a normal situation for any horse. It must be either EMS or it must be Cushingoid. Something's wrong with its insulin, basically. It would be my concern or it's... Carrier isn't bad, but you probably spot that when you go to see it. So yeah, my 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 feeling is investigate that. There's something that's not under control. Yes. Um, and then another question: um, How effective is metformin, and how long would you keep a horse on it? I mean, that's always a one for debate. I think depending who you talk to sometimes. <laughs> Very much. Go I mean, metformin probably isn't the most effective drug we have, actually. And I think probably the new drugs that we have coming through, so the, the flag the flows in these drugs, they show a lot more promise of being more effective. So um, I guess that's kind of a watch this space that we, you know, hopefully we'll be able to use them more as time goes on and they look quite promising. Metformin can help. Um, but you have to remember what metformin does is basically metformin helps reduce the sort of local insulin effect from sugar. So actually, if you're feeding a low sugar diet, you shouldn't really need metformin anyway. So yes, we use it and yes, it can be helpful. But actually, if you're feeding a really appropriate low sugar diet, adding metformin probably isn't that useful. Yeah, I agree. Exactly that. OK, fab. Um, if it's OK, then I will crack on. If you're happy to answer some of the other ones um, under the chat or the Q&A bit, please do. Um, there's some interesting ones in there. And then if there are any you think that we should cover at the end for benefits of everyone, um, make a note and we'll, we'll come back to them. <laughs> um, okay, so let me just share my screen. Um, hopefully everyone's seen it okay. <clears throat> let me just hide that. Let me just collapse, hang on. <laughs> I can't actually see my own controls because the screen is so cluttered with stuff. Okay, so I'm going to look at um, feeding and managing the, the good deal. So over the course of the um, campaign that we've been running with vet partners, it's really apparent how the, the sort of two approaches are um, not necessarily different, but would have 
um, different parameters that we're working to. So there's that sort of longer term management strategy versus the acute scenario. And very much from the veterinary perspective, you're dealing with an immediate um, animal in pain and all of those sorts of priorities. And then where the nutritionist might come in is looking at the longer term management and how we reduce the risk of it happening again through um, diet, et cetera. So I tried to break the diet down into three chunks because one of the recurring themes we get from horse owners is that you know, feeding is very confusing. There's so many things to think about. So if we break it down, we're going to look at the grass. Um, we're then going to look at the right forage. And then thirdly, we have the bucket feed. And, and they're basically the three areas of the diet that we want to, to get control over and, and manage for these good doers. Um, now, why do we need to... Uh, sort of manage this grass intake well essentially um, and a bit like Emily was talking about in those winter months normally the horse would lose weight because the grass quality deteriorates and um, we I suppose they're calling it an energy gap these days and there isn't so much of an energy gap that is the fundamental sort of thing that's occurred um, over the last sort of um, 10, 20 years, I suppose, we're getting milder winters and the grass is still growing. So the difference between the energy that the grass provides and the energy the horse needs um, is getting smaller. So basically, there's way more than, than the animal um, needs most of the year. And it's only in the depths of winter that the requirement dips below what the grass is supplying. So on this slide here, you can see the requirements um, for light work are the green horizontal lines running throughout the year. For maintenance, it's sort of dark blue black line running across the slide. And then the yellow is the amount of energy that a horse at grass 24-7 would consume. Now, again, as I say, I've highlighted winter there because I suspect that the energy that the grass is containing in the winter months is probably increasing. So these are average values that we take from the computer program that we use for ration evaluation. Um, and that's probably going to be continuing to increase if we experience these milder winters. And certainly in the southeast of England, um, this last year, we, had, we didn't have any snow um, at all, and we really only had a few frosts and um, probably count them on you know, one set of fingers. So um, the chances of the horse actually losing weight if he's out at grass is, is reducing because it's making such a, a, a big contribution to his overall energy requirement. So this is why we've got to get um, a grip on how much the grass the horse is consuming. And, you know, we have some options available to us. Now, whenever we're dealing with herbivores, it's much like a pet dog or cat. In theory, if you stop giving them tidbits and things, everything that they need in their diet can come in one bag, you know exactly how much to give, and you've got complete control. But any animal that's eating grass or forages, there's a certain amount of variability in that um, that grass is beyond your control so it's impacted by weather and the species of plant in that pasture and um, so many variables that you can't control and that's why it's difficult and even actually when it comes down to analyzing what energy these um, forages have got in them it's not very reliable because of the variability in the structure of the sugars and the energy that's in the grass um, it's also very hard to know exactly what the horse is consuming even when we've tested it and you know, horses will all eat at different rates, just as humans do. We have average values, but clearly there are going to be some that eat a lot more than, than others. So as I say, lots of variables. Now, we do have some things within our control that we can try and do to reduce grass intake. Um, the no grass area there, fairly obviously, get them off it completely. Um, the sort of traditional strip grazing more innovative ways of keeping horses entertained on limited pasture have been introduced in the last sort of five, 10 years and becoming ever more inventive. So the track systems, which effectively is um, cordoning off an area around the edge of the field, so it encourages a bit more movement so that um, the horse in the restricted area can actually move around and be closer to, to friends so they don't tend to get so distressed if they're stuck in one corner, if their friend disappears off over the horizon. Um, and if you don't have the luxury of the sort of strip grazing or track systems, then there are tools like grazing muscles. Now, they don't work everywhere. We've, we've worked with charities that are open to the public and the animals that are on display, um, you know, just given up trying to put them in muzzles because the general public just 
obviously, you know, their impression of it is something that's really barbaric. And however much you try and put notices up and explain it for the you know, benefit of the animal, um, you know, it, it takes up too much staff time trying to, to explain it to, to nearly every visitor. So there are situations where you know, grazing muzzles aren't, aren't appropriate, but they, you know, they can be a useful tool and they may be the only option for, for some individuals. But I have to say, if we're going to get complete control over what's going into our horse, then a bare paddock is the, you know, the key, isn't it? We, we basically take grass out of the equation. We're removing one of those variables that we effectively can't control if they have access to it. And it may not mean that you've got to do it all year, all the time. You can use it tactically at times when the grass is abundant um, or when your horse is at higher risk. Um, or just when it's um, you know, in the winter months where it helps to actually protect the paddocks, these are becoming more popular for lots of different horses, regardless of whether they have a, a weight issue or not. So there are more yards starting to offer this sort of thing. Um, and you know, sometimes there's a lot of objections to you know, reasons why I can't do something to try and control my horse's weight. And it's not always the horse owner, it's often or can be the livery yard and they don't always want people to track sections off of their fields and um, you know, it may come down to having to move yards um, to, to make sure that your horse isn't going to end up with, with laminitis. So again, it's all of these things you tend to be rewarded for the amount of effort you, you put in. Um, now grazing muzzles are, um, as, as I say, a little bit of a contentious um, my colleague Tracy Hammond, who is one of the nutritionists at Denji, did a study for her master's um, back in 2005 and sort of tested out grazing muzzles for her own interest and obviously from a Denji perspective too. Um, and she found a reduction in intake by around, of around 75 to 86%. And then in some published work by Annette Longland and colleagues in 2011, um, they found a similar re reduction in intake, a range of around 75 to 88% compared to, to unrestricted grazing um, through using the muzzle. So um, two pieces of work finding a, a very similar reduction in intake, which is in, um, quite a, a significant one and therefore suggests that muzzles can be useful. Um, during that three hour grazing period, um, you know, those that would, um, had their muscles down or didn't have muscles, sorry, um, consumed 0.8% dry matter of their body weight. So a really significant um, proportion of what they needed or what they should be consuming in just three hours. So, um, you know, it does go to show just how effective these muzzles can actually be. And Annette Longland um, in some follow-up studies suggested that using a muzzle for 10 out of a 24 hour grazing period may help to reduce weight um, in some individuals. Now, it does depend what happens the rest of the day. We know that when we take these muzzles off, um, certain individuals, ponies in particular, will then overconsume or compensatory consume um, extra grazing to, to make up for their restrictions. So um, if you can bring them off the um, pasture when you take the muzzle off and potentially put them into either stables or um, smaller areas, then you know, a really useful tactical um, tool to help you. If you are going to introduce the muzzle, try and do it gradually. Um, make sure the horse is happy to drink and eat with the muzzle on. Um, and you do have to be aware that because they can't um, you know, use their teeth to, to sort of bite back, they can um, be bullied by others in, in the group. They, they've lost one of their um, means of defence against them. So um, you know, do sort of bear that in mind, especially with older individuals um, that might be down the um, hierarchy anyway um, and obviously if you need to adapt it a little bit to make sure it's comfortable you can put vet wrap or other um, materials around to try and make them a little bit um, softer so they don't rub um, and again some horses are very adept and ponies are getting out of them so you might need to customize them to make sure they they stay on but again up to sort of 10 12 hours wearing a muzzle then bring into the stable or a no grass area for maximum control if you can um, so if we're going to reduce the amount of pasture and or grass that a, a horse is consuming, then we've got to make sure they're getting sufficient forage. And again, looking at the conserved forage, um, picking out which one for the good doer is probably an area where we get a lot of calls now and probably more so than even the, the bucket feed, because that's almost the easy bit. The forage is actually the much harder bit to, to get right. 
So what is storage? Well, we're conserving materials that are high in fibre and typically in the UK, it will be things like grass, cereal, straw and, and alfalfa. Um, we conserve either by removing the water, so that's simply drying them, or we take the air away. So if we wrap it in plastic and turn it into um, usually a, a sort of fermented forage. Now we can sun dry to take um, the water away. So in the, again, in the UK, that would be typically grass or straw to make hay. Um, and then obviously the straw is the byproduct from the, the cereal harvest, or we can use hot air. And that's what um, someone, you know, like a company like Denji and others that are making these sort of short chop dried forages would, would do. We are using hot air to take the moisture off. And again, it's usually alfalfa or grass that's being um, dried in that way. And um, you can have chopped formats, as you can see in the scoop in the bucket there, um, and then they tend to be um, bagged. You don't tend to have long length forages dried artificially, they usually sun dried. Now, when we take the air away, we're creating this anaerobic environment, and that can result in fermentation. And the sort of strict definition of that would be silage or a true haylage. But you need to have some moisture present in that forage for that fermentation process to occur. And what we're increasingly seeing, and I'm talking about this a lot at the moment, because most of our wrapped forages really are actually better defined as wrapped haze. So they're wrapped and dry. They've always been dried to the point of being a hay before they're actually wrapped in plastic. And this has some really crucial differences in terms of the nutritional content um, of the forage. And that's why it's so important to make sure we know what we're actually dealing with, um, because the key um, nutrients, things like sugar, um, the acidity of the forage itself, um, are, are very different according to whether there was enough moisture for the fermentation to occur or not. And this is a combination of data. So you can see the bits highlighted in yellow or the analysis that we do at Denji. So if a customer wants um, a hay or a forage analysed, we will have we have that service available. And this is the data that we've got for what we're defining as a wrapped hay. The other three columns um, labelled there as hay, haylage and silage are from a study done by Cecilia Muller and colleagues in um, Sweden. And the reason this um, study is really interesting um, to us is the fact that they try to reduce some of the variables by using the same fields with the same grass species in it and converting it into three different forages at the same time. Now that rarely happens. And in a lot of studies and a lot of feeding trials and things, it, or when we're looking at rations for customers, we're comparing haze and haylages or wrapped haze or whatever. They're taken from different parts of the country. They're often um, you know, from sort of taken at different times of the year, harvested at, um, you know, anywhere between May and August. So there's a lot of variables in what you're sort of comparing. Whereas this study is really nice in the sense that it removed or reduced some of those variables. And what it shows is the importance of having that moisture to see whether the fermentation occurs or not. So in hay, you wouldn't expect there to be any fermentation. And we use lactic acid as a marker of that. So that's zero in the, with the highlighted in the green. So all the sugar, the WSC, water soluble carbohydrates, is, is still there. And at the other end of the spectrum, they made a silage. Well, obviously that water soluble carbohydrate, the sugar, has been converted. That's what happens when you into an acid, a fatty acid, a lactic acid in this case. So you can see how it's switched. The sugar levels dropped, but the acidity level has, has come up. Now, um, we talk about this a lot in the context of ulcers, but when we're talking about it in terms of um, laminitis risk, you know, the, the general advice is to try and keep the sugar levels low well obviously if you are converting it to a fatty acid the sugar level has actually been reduced and that is why it gets a bit confusing a little bit counterintuitive at times um, and it's often because the halages and the silages are actually more conditioning so what do we prioritize do we prioritize the thing that's less likely to promote weight gain or do we prioritize using a forage that's lower in sugar and we'll, we'll look at that in a bit more detail as, as we go through but the point about this is that the wrapped hay still has the same level of sugar as a normal hay. It's too dry to ferment, so the sugar levels are, are the same. So just because it's a wrapped forage doesn't mean to say um, that it's, it hasn't got the sugar in there. So if it um, hasn't fermented, it will still have the same sugar as a, a normal um, dry hay. So the sort of top five factors to 
to think about the effect of forage quality, we're obviously, what are we conserving? So is it grass, is it straw, alfalfa, et cetera? And then when we look at grass in particular, what species? So um, classically, we think of Timothy as the lower sugar option and rye grass tends to be higher in sugar. Um, now that doesn't mean to say that you can't have a high sugar Timothy forage. Um, and again, why uh, analysis is important and helpful. Um, some of these other factors will have a big impact on the sugar present in the forage, regardless of the species. Um, timing is key. So the maturity of the plant, not just when it was harvested, um, the later the cut, the typically, the more mature the grass plants are, the less digestible they are. So if you have the luxury of making your own forage or you're asking a farmer local to you that you can work with, if they can cut it later in the year as a first cut, um, maybe even in, in to as far as August, is going to be more mature, more fibrous and lower in sugar typically. So you're certainly increasing your chances of having a low sugar forage. But do be aware if you're just buying forage and you ask for something cut in August, do specify that it is still a first cut because some farmers will take a second cut um, and be cutting it in sort of August, September for their second cut. Um, and that obviously defeats the object because it's still going to be a, a younger grass plant and therefore probably more nutritious and, and potentially higher in sugar. So it is important you specify late cut, first cut forage. Um, weather conditions, so sun equals more photosynthesis. And um, that's what produces the sugar in, in the actual grass plant. Um, and sort of timing, also is when the grass is um, using sugar is overnight in the dark and it makes sugar when it's light. So if you can cut or ask your farmer to cut the forage early in the morning, um, they will obviously have to wait a little bit because they don't want the morning dew to make it wet. Um, but as soon as they can, try and cut it early in the day rather than later, um, because that's when the grass plants are likely to have their lowest sugar content because they would have been using up some sugar overnight. And obviously if they, um, you know, in the UK, we're largely limited by the weather. We're going to cut when it's fine and bright and all of that. But if you can, in an ideal world, when it's a bit overcast and cloudier, it's likely to have a slightly lower sugar content than if it's bright sunshine um, and, you know, the plants are producing sugar at the rate of knots. Um, if any of you remember as pre-pandemic, as far back as 2018, um, that extremely long hot summer that we had, and we saw some of the highest sugar levels um, that we'd seen in forage analysis. We, I think we've topped it since then, um, but normally we would expect to see anything between 15, 20, maybe 25% um, water-soluble carbohydrates in some of the UK grass forages. Um, in 2018, they were topping 35%. So it was just a, a result of that really light, bright, sunny um, weather that we had for prolonged periods of time. And also probably drought um, is that impacting the, the plant as well, concentrating its, its sugar levels. So all of those are things to think about. We don't all live in a perfect world, so it's, it's hard to implement some of these things. But you know, even if you can just do one or two of them, everything we're doing all the time to try and reduce the risk has you know, got to be a positive step in the right direction. Um, so what should you use? Well, sometimes it comes down to what have you got? And you know, as nutritionists, we're working in the real world with real people, trying to make the best of, of what's available. Um, and you know, again, climate change is certainly having an impact on the availability of forages and demand for forages has gone up in recent times for different purposes. And it becomes harder and harder to find the forage that, that you want. So you know, sometimes um, you're using something that isn't ideal and isn't perfect, and there are things we can do to try and help, which we'll talk about in just a second. But as I, as I alluded to earlier, we're really trying to distinguish between sugar content and how fattening the forage is, and they're not necessarily the same, or you don't always have both. Now, the default recommendation tends to be hay because it is usually higher in fiber and therefore less digestible and therefore less likely to promote weight gain. And we can usually reduce the sugar content um, with various strategies. So that tends to be um, what is used. Now we have a, a case study to finish off with where um, you know, analysis and, and information came into to play. Um, but as a general principle, this is, this is why we go with hay, um, because we can try to reduce some of the sugar content. 
Now, um, soaking always generates some debate. Um, we've been at sort of various conferences virtually over the last sort of 12, 18 months. Um, and some of the researchers are advocating in the region of 10 parts water to one part hay. And again, in the real world, can we achieve that? It's a, a huge amount of water um, that's required to do a 10 part to one part ratio. But the general rule of thumb is the more water you can use, um, the greater the, the losses are likely to be. And similarly with temperature, really, um, warmer water tends to result in more sugar losses. And so it's advocated that if you can get the um, temperature of the water up and sustain it, um, that's going to be um, helpful too. So again, timing is one of those that creates a, a, a fair amount of debate between researchers. Um, the feedback at the sort of relatively recent conferences has been that if the more water you can use and the warmer water you can use, the shorter the time period you need to soak it for. Um, but generally speaking, most people are soaking for at least two um, hours to try and achieve some significant water, um, sugar loss. Um, obviously, in warmer weather, that becomes less practical to do it for longer because you tend to find that the hay is starting to ferment. And you also have to consider that what you're losing as well as sugar is the dry matter. And this is where the debate starts to kick in as to um, once you're losing dry matter from the hay from soaking it for such a long period, you're ending up having to feed more to ensure the dry matter intake is achieved. And we're aiming for one and a half percent on a dry matter basis. So obviously, if you can, it's better to start with a low sugar forage in the first place or a lower sugar forage um, if you possibly can. But in the real world, if you don't have that available to you, you know, soaking in lots of water, warm water if you can, um, and sort of two hours is um, as a minimum really what you should be trying to, to do. Not everyone can use hay. So for respiratory health reasons, then a wrapped hay may well work for these horses. There's no reason not to use it nutritionally. Um, poor dentition, it can seem a little bit counterintuitive of a horse with poor teeth. Um, you wouldn't expect them to be good doers, but believe me, they can be. Um, and sometimes they can't manage the coarse hay, so we're looking for alternatives for them. Sometimes the yard only has haylage, in inverted commas, available, a true haylage. Um, shortage of supply, as I alluded to, um, you know, and what do we do if the hay analysis actually comes back better than the, the sort of haylage that we've got available to us? So, um, you know, it's very easy to judge people, but there may be reasons why they are using a haylage or a wrapped forage for their um, EMS or laminitic. Now, um, straw, again, has caused sort of confusion or concern at various times. Um, historically, the sort of advice or the suggestion has been to use up to a third um, of the total forage um, ration as straw. But there was a study published late in 2021, and although its primary objective was to try and um, establish whether it increased the risk of ulcers, um, it also showed that actually um, it slowed the rate of intake of the forage to such an extent in the evening meal in particular that there was hardly any insulin anemic response at all. And obviously Emily and Lucy talked a lot about these high elevated insulin levels being a problem or the insulin dysregulation being an issue. So if we can use straw tactically in, in a way to um, effectively have no discernible insulin anemic response to a forage meal, um, then this is a huge step forward in terms of and managing these good doers and EMS and PPID cases. And it, it's something that you know, I, I'm really interested in and really keen in, in, in the context of bucket feed, but also in the forage is this rate of intake. So it's not just what we're putting in and the nutritional value of that, it's how quickly these animals are consuming it in terms of the impact it has on peaks in blood glucose and obviously therefore insulin. So um, this is why this study was, was so interesting. It, like in nutrition, most of the time, equine nutrition is one study so far. So you know, we do have to be a little bit cautious about it, but it's, it's something that's um, a, a great indicator if we can reproduce this effect. Um, through the use of straw, um, you know, it, it's really, really positive news. And what they found with, the, um, with this study is they replaced haylage in this instance with up to 50% wheat straw. 
Um, as I say, they were specifically looking to see whether there was any impact in terms of causing ulcers, because that's been one of the concerns about using straw, and they didn't see any incidence of ulcers. So um, it ticked a box from being safe there. Now, when it comes to using straw, we always suggest you talk to your vet about it, particularly if there's a history of impact from colics or poor dentition. You know, it's obviously not going to be an appropriate ingredient for every horse or pony, but for those with blooming good teeth that chomp their way through um, you know, forage happily, it could be a great way to provide some forage without too much sugar and obviously with a reduced calorie or energy um, level as well. Now with our rough calculations, when we um, replaced a third of the average hay we'd be using with straw, in this case it was an oat straw, um, we were seeing a 16% reduction in, in the sort of energy or calorie intake. If we're starting to replace up to 50% of the forage ration with straw, and if you're replacing a really good sort of high quality forage, so something like haylage, then your scope for reduction is even greater, potentially a 25% reduction in calorie intake. And yet you're not compromising them in terms of the volume and the, the sort of two time they're getting for their sort of health and well-being. Um, and I think it's interesting to note, we use a reference text called the NRC, and they highlight how it takes around um, an 11 to 15% um, reduction in energy intake to shift them half a unit on a five point body condition scoring system, which would be about one point on a nine um, point scale. So in other words, we're gonna shift them um, you know, a whole point on the nine point scale if we make this simple change of, of putting straw into the ration. Um, obviously, you, know, you can use short chopped straw for the use in the bucket. Um, you can use it as a partial hay replacer if, if that's a, an easy, convenient way for you to do it. Or you can buy long length straw um, from you know, a farmer or a supplier. And as I say, I can't reiterate it strongly enough. If you have a history or your horse has a history of issues, you might want to consult your vet about it or talk it through with them um, and see what the level of risk is. And with any ingredient that you're introducing to the ration, do so gradually. Um, but at least we're having some papers now exploring these areas of and seeing how we can um, basically provide fiber without um, calories in a safe way. And what about analysis? I've talked about it's sort of being very difficult to um, analyze things like sugars in forages. They're not uniform. They give labs an, a bit of a challenge trying to um, identify or ascertain what the levels are. Um, analysis is only good, as good as sampling. You know, if you take one sample from one bale, it's gonna tell you a little bit about that bale. It's not necessarily gonna tell you about the whole batch. So if you can take multiple samples, mix them together, that's going to be a little bit more representative. When you're looking at analysis supplied by companies, do try and make sure you're comparing like with like because some will analyze for simple sugars, some will analyze water soluble carbohydrates, some will use an NIR system, some will use wet chemistry. So you know, it is important to make sure you're comparing like with likes, particularly in the context of, of feeds. Um, but do ask us, you know, that's what we're there for. If you have results and you're not sure what they are, what they mean, um, we can help interpret them for you. And you've also got to use them alongside what you know, can see and feel about the foragers as well. So they're an indicator, they give you more information and, and the more you know about that forage, um, the better. Um, and if the haylage comes back lower in the DE than the hay, so the energy value, um, and the other info you have supports this, there's no logical reason really not to use it. Otherwise, why analyze? And um, again, I'm putting all these things in here to, to build up to the case study that we have um, at the end. Our challenge is always to try and make forage last longer. So if you can, just like your bucket feed principle, split it into as many meals as possible. Um, one of the recurring themes we're asked on the feed line um, and the challenges I think that people have with good doers, they're so worried about ulcers and the importance of feeding plenty of fibre to try and reduce the risk of ulcers, that the temptation is to overfeed or provide too many um, calories or too much energy and then you end up with a, a, an overweight pony or horse um, because you're trying to do the right thing and reduce their risk of ulcers and end up feeding them too much unfortunately. So if we can um, sort of keep the ration to one and a half percent of body weight um, per day on a dry matter basis, then we have to try and split it into as many meals as possible. We don't want really any more than sort of six hours. That's um, again, another study that's shown um, reducing availability to, or access to forage increases the risk of ulcers if it's more than six hours. 
Um, so we've got to divide it into many small um, offerings throughout the day if we can. And if you are going to use chopped fiber, put it in a truck or a bucket, you can put like a large football or some really large um, sort of ornamental stones so they're way too big that a horse couldn't accidentally pick them up. Um, if they're smooth pebbly type things then they shouldn't cause them any harm. It weighs the bucket down as well so it helps to stop some of them kicking it across and, and then um, despite all your best efforts just gobbling it all down. So anything you can do so they have you've reduced the surface area, they have to work a little bit harder to access that forage, um, you know, the better it will be. And obviously, if you are using nets and small hold nets and divide them into several um, portions around the stable will help to encourage a bit of natural sort of foraging behaviour as well. So the sort of takeaway actions really are there for the, um, the forage. So um, I won't go over all of those again, but hopefully they're the key points that um, you can refer back to if, if you want to look at the, the recording. And then we often are asked, why do good doers need a bucket feed? Well, um, this ration here is the, the sort of mentioned, the computer program we use to sort of break the ration down and, and show you exactly what um, levels of nutrients are coming from the diet. And this is just taking an average hay on its own with nothing else. So a sort of dieting hay ration for a 500 kilo horse. And what it's showing is that the usual deficiencies are there. Um, you know, grasses and forages reflect the soils they're grown on. We know the soils in the UK are deficient in things like selenium and copper. So inevitably, they're not going to magically appear from somewhere and suddenly be present in our in our grass and our forage that we're feeding to our animals. Um, so we have to just top up on those essential nutrients, even for good doers, um, and especially for good doers, you could argue, um, because they're, you know, they're not getting much forage probably throughout the year at all. So it is important we supplement them with those, those essential nutrients. When you are looking for a feed to put in the bucket, aim for low calorie, and low calorie really is less than eight and a half megajoules per kilo of DE these days. You need feeds that are high in fiber, low in sugar and starch. And if you can use the chopped versions, they will weigh less in a scoop, so they can help to satisfy that appetite and increase um, chew time. And you don't need to feed very much of them. If you're doing your forage amounts through your hay or whatever it is you're using, um, just a double handful to mix your balancer or your vitamin and mineral supplement into is all you need. These meals do not need to be big. It's only when you're using the chopped fibers as a partial hay replacer or to contribute to your forage requirement that you need to feed volumes of them. So it can be very simple. It can be very cost effective, um, which is going to be a key theme coming up in the next months feed and food prices are escalating sadly um, but yeah it doesn't have to be complicated and it certainly doesn't have to be expensive to get a really good quality balanced diet that will help to keep these horses healthy and in, in good condition um, and this just makes the point really about how balances work now it's the same sort of principle for a supplement but a lot of myths exist about balances people look at percentages things like um, a 16% crude protein value on a balancer and think it's really, really high. But actually, because you're only feeding 500 grams, it's providing a relatively low level. It's enough, but it's not excessive. Um, whereas if you compare it to a high fiber cube, which is 10% protein, to get the balance of the nutrients in those cubes, you should be feeding two kilos or 2000 grams as opposed to 500 grams of the balancer. So if they're used in the right way and fed at the recommended amount, they're providing a lot more protein um, than the balancer actually would. So percentages are only one part of the, the story. You need to look at how much you're feeding and then whether you're actually getting the rest of the, the nutrients that your horse needs. You can feed less of the high fiber cubes, but what it means is you won't get the copper either. And as we saw on the previous slide, um, that's one of the minerals that is really important. It's not going to be there in their forage ration, particularly a, a reduced forage ration. So the balancer is providing those essential nutrients. You can see there 110 milligrams from the feeding rate, way more than the high fiber cubes would be doing. And then if you're feeding less than recommended of the high fiber cubes, they're still probably going to be deficient in copper. So it really defeats the object. You quite frankly, might as well not bother because you're getting energy that you don't need, which is just going to fuel the weight gain and nothing or nothing valuable um, of the things that you do need. So you, you know, less is more in this context. Use things like supplements and balance, balances, which are really concentrated, giving you the nutrients you need 
um, and without the calories that you don't. Um, so some example rations there, I mean, that most people use in our range would be the high fi because they've got straw in, so it brings the energy value down, um, and with a balance or a supplement. And I put deliberately put the performance ones versions of those in there because they have the highest spec of vitamins and minerals. There's nothing in those products that means you can't feed them to a horse at rest or pony at rest if you need to. Um, and they just give you really good levels of all those essential nutrients. And if that horse is in recovery or trying to repair damaged tissues and you want better hoof quality, um, then it's worth investing a bit more in a higher spec balance or a supplement to help um, those new tissues come through quicker and stronger and better, basically. Where's that? There we go. So I just wanted to finish off with a case study because um, you know, we often talk in these um, good doer and sort of weight management talks about the typical native pony, but it isn't always a problem. Um, and I think increasingly now, it most definitely isn't always a problem of the, the native or the cobby types. Um, this is an example, and actually my colleague Claire Akers is behind the scenes somewhere, and, and she's the lady that um, uh, works with Amanda and this horse, um, Remy, so she's much better placed, so she can fill you in if I get any of the details um, wrong as we go through, but he was um, long-listed for Tokyo 2020, um, along with his rider Amanda Shirtcliffe, who is a, on the Para um, World Class Programme. Um, he's always been um, chunky, which I think is one of those euphemisms for fat or overweight, um, was actually diagnosed with EMS um, last year. I just think this is probably the year before last now. Um, obviously, metformin wasn't allowed to be used under FEI competition rules, so they were um, very much having to manage um, through dietary changes and, and weight loss strategies, which I think a lot of vets would suggest is probably the best way anyway. Um, so you can see there, he'd been scored at a four and a half out of five. His weight was around 720 kilos for um, a 16.3 Oldenburg. So definitely needed to lose some weight. Now, this is when the rule book goes out the window because we would well be putting him on one of those high five products that I mentioned um, because he needed low sugar and low calorie. But despite being quite a good doer and a little bit portly, um, Remy can actually be very fussy. So our challenge was to really try and find something as safe as we could for him um, that he could actually be tempted to eat. I think we could probably describe him as a bit of a diva and actually eating straw was somewhat beneath him. But we actually ended up using Alfred Original um, with the Performance Plus Balancer so because he is working. Um, he's competing in dressage, para dressage regularly and things. Um, so. You know, he, he is working, he needs those nutrients from the Performance Plus Balancer very much so. Um, now, Alfred Original wouldn't have been the product we would have gone to first, but it was the one that we could actually tempt him to eat. <clears throat> but most importantly, and this is why I've been talking about analysis and, you know, if we're going to analyse, um, you know, believing in the results and do it, you know, taking heed from them and also looking at the importance of looking at the whole ration if you really want to make a difference because we could have just played around with his bucket feed um, but without looking at his forage um, we wouldn't have got to the bottom of or a lot of the problem and um, the forage he was on was 36.8 percent WSC which was actually the hay and um, we analyzed a lower WSC option which came back at 17.6 and that was actually the wrapped forage, so hay or um, wrapped hay or haylage. Now that does give the horse owner a, a dilemma, doesn't it? If, if they would have been using the hay, thinking that was the safer option, until they actually analysed it and looked at it and found that actually, you know, that was way way higher in sugar um, than the, the sort of wrapped forage option. Now it took a bit of battling to get the support team around her, because obviously she's on this BF program to be convinced that to move to the, the haylage was the right thing to do, um, but it paid off, you know, and Claire and myself sort of had a fair few meetings convincing, um, say, her support crew that this was the right thing to do. Um, and, and it was spelled out to us that if he didn't lose weight and his insulin levels didn't improve, he wouldn't be going to Tokyo, whether he was, you know, selected or not for the team. Um, but you can see by getting hold of the complete diet, um, Claire in particular goes um, out to weigh him regularly and work really closely with Amanda um, and they achieved a really good level of, of weight loss. Nice, consistent, steady, not too dramatic 
um, to cause any other issues, but steady, consistent weight loss, which um, got him much nearer to where he needed to be um, for if he was to go to the Olympics. Um, and you can see there the insulin levels now. At 91, it still had a way to go, but it was a vast improvement on the 300 that he had tested out, which was what prompted um, you know, the whole sort of discussion in the first place. Um, and we got him down to a condition score of um, three and a half out of five. So it, I think the last count, and Claire can probably update us later, um, the weight loss to date at that point was 60 kilos. Um, and funnily enough, he was a much more forward going and sort of energetic horse as, as a result, because he wasn't lugging that excess weight around. So that just gives you a bit of an insight into some of the, the rules and the, the sort of theory. And then when we have to throw it all out because horses are horses and don't read the rule book, um, you know, we can get results still. So that's what we're here for you know, as a company, as a nutritionist, is to help you with the long term management of, of these horses. Um, but thank you very much. And I will stop the share, I'll see if I can find <laughs> Lucy and Emily um, in the dark. It's got very dark here, actually. Give me a second. Um, we can see whether there are any other questions. Hello, Lucy, you're back. No, no. <laughs> have you been busy behind the scenes? <laughs> I've been I typing think... answers. I hope that people have seen them where I've replied, but obviously it's not always easy. Brilliant. And um, it's really lovely. We've had people from Canada and Italy and all sorts, um, which is really nice to, to see. Um, are there any ones that were interesting that you thought would be really useful to share? Um, I think there was there was quite a bit of chat about how to keep sugar low in the diet, but you probably covered that, I think, quite well. So hopefully those people are, are satisfied. And I think uh, others have sort of asked specific questions about their own horses and, you know, interesting levels. What, what drugs can I give the horse? I think it's really important to just describe how complex these cases are. Um, mm -hmm. No two are the same. So whilst our advice is generic. Um, it's really important to point out it's not specific to your horse because none of us have seen your individual horses or seen the histories that come with them. So I think working together with or finding if you haven't really got any qualified nutritionists such as yourselves at Denji to, to, to get a consultation with and also working with your vet um, is really important. There's no harm in getting advice elsewhere, but um, it's really important the person that sees your horse and gives you specific advice and has all the information. Um, can hopefully come up with the correct answers because it is difficult they are hard cases and lots of people here really clearly are doing everything they can they're doing lots of grass restriction dieting um you know trying to keep, get insulin down keep these horses comfortable so um it just shows you how difficult it is for some cases yeah very very much so and, and there is a lot of conflicting information out there as, as well knowing who to trust and sort of where to get your information from is it's always a challenge as well, isn't it? It's, um, a few um, people have... Oh, sorry, Carol. I feel say with the dreaded internet as well, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think that's it. And I think you've got to be careful exactly like in, in sort of, um, you know, social media groups and forums and things, you know, everyone, and even on here, you can see everyone's had their own little stories and some are successful and some aren't, but um, it's really hard to extrapolate, isn't it, from, from one horse to others so I think yeah just bear in, bear that in mind relating to that someone and I think a couple of people actually mentioned breed and genetics and I think that's a really classical um, issue that we probably haven't appreciated enough until now and certainly there's more and more research looking into breed types um, what we call obesogenic factors you know so whether that's the environment or the or the breed and body type of the horse I'm sure in the future we'll know more about these things, but we do know that natives, cob breeds, uh, I mean, Emily mentioned it, Arabs, things like that, do seem to be predisposed to getting some of these weight, insulin, stroke, laminitis issues. So if you have horses of that type, I would say almost go into ownership with these animals expecting problems because it's great if you don't get them <laughs> but equally they are the most common types that and breeds that I see um, with issues so if you can preempt that by making the correct management um, changes or putting the correct management um, protocols in place you hopefully won't get laminitis <laughs> or obesity yes. or you know all these other related issues so I think, yeah, looking at the horse you've got or looking at the horse you might buy or, or the type that you're looking to, to be an owner of is really important because then you can try and put things in place that will avoid going down these roads. 
Yeah, um, one of the questions that I think Claire is actually typing an answer to this specific person, but steaming, it's a, it's a good one to raise because um, the research so far is basically the steaming is not going to leach sugars out. So it obviously does the respiratory um, and does sorts out the hygienic side of things, but it isn't going to dramatically reduce the sugar. So um, Miriam or Collier um, on behalf of Haygain has done a lot of the studies at um, Fire and Sester for this. Um, and she advocates if you're going to um, soak, soak first to reduce the sugar content and then steam to um, basically make it cleaner, get rid of bacteria and things. Now, um, you know, horses have, have kind of eaten soaked hay for quite some time now, but um, when they've done their studies, um, they found high levels of bacteria and moulds and things. Um, so it is um, their advice to soak first to get the sugar out and then steam to, to deal with that. So um, it's a bit of a faff, <laughs> quite a long-winded process, but, you know, if you're going to do everything you possibly can, um, then yeah. that is the advice. And Steam, the steaming is definitely good if you've got access to it, but yeah, I agree mm. with you. That if you are just if you haven't got the luxury of a steamer, then just being sensible about your way you soak your hay, so changing the water, um, not doing it in direct sunlight where there's you know warmth and UV rays to help bacteria grow and stuff like that. So you know it's that kind of stuff, isn't it? Doing it in clean containers, etc. Yes, cleaning your smelly um, yeah, <laughs> so they're tank out right. definitely. Um, <laughs> And it says, um, I don't know if you have a view on this, both of you, do you think shoeing causes laminitis or it can? Um, what do you think about natural trimming? Oh, Emily, I don't know what your thoughts are, but I, I did touch on this, didn't I? I think shoeing doesn't, well, you can get mechanical laminitis, but you have to have really terrible long toes, you know, splayed walls, like flared mm -hmm. walls, I think, to get to that stage. And probably splitting and things of the hoof or you know do you pretty bad feet for that to be the only cause and, and it to cause laminitis what I think is much more common is you get these metabolic cases these overweight horses which in themselves probably cause bad feet because the, the, the pure excess weight probably causes the feet to flatten and splay but I think what happens is the mechanics of poor shoeing can then just rock them over the edge into a laminitic episode um I don't think there's a huge difference between natural trimming and shoeing. I think each horse needs to be assessed individually on that basis. I have no preference for either. I know horses that can absolutely go all day without any shoes on. I know horses that couldn't survive a day without shoes on. So I think there is no good and bad between trimming and shoeing. What I think is interesting, people often refer to nature, which is fine, but then we're probably not keeping them in the same conditions that are, are encapsulating a natural living background and lifestyle. So it's it's very difficult to compare a, you know, a, a pleasure horse or a sports horse to a horse that's living in the wild. So I think we need to be careful about drawing those conclusions, but every horse is an individual is what I would say, and you have to take it that way. Yes, very much so. And just on the slightly other side, natural is always perceived to be good, and it's not necessarily that it's bad, but it can be bad. <laughs> Natural can be poisonous, natural, you know, it's very different um, meanings. So yeah, natural isn't always the, the right option. Absolutely. Um, when you mentioned ponies also, I think you're typing actually, Emily, on that one. So I'll leave you to answer that one. Um, and then I don't know if it was a follow-up. He's a 21 year old Welsh cob, came on after oral steroids for respiratory allergy mm. after not responding to ventipulmin. I think there's there's been a, a quite a, Quite robust paper proving that and I mean research paper proving that steroid use and laminitis isn't as clear an, an association as we used to mm. think it is as in we use a lot of steroids in a lot of horses but again I think going back to this tipping point trigger thing I think some horses that are literally on the knife edge of going into laminitis and we don't know that because we haven't had the issue yet um, I think anything could potentially push them over. That could be the vaccination thing we talked about. That could be uh, a little infection causing a sort of slight mild sepsis or something. It could be that little bit of bad shoeing or long toes or, you know, overdue shoeing. Or it could indeed be some steroid use. So I think, again, we don't know the full story, but um, I don't think it's as simple as a completely healthy horse that's got no issues being given a medication like all steroids and becoming laminitic. I don't know, Emily, what would you say? I think there might be something grumbling in the background of those cases that hasn't been, been, been evident until that point. 
Yeah, I agree. I think it's exactly that. It's a steroids in a horse that's already on the edge, can tip them over the edge. But actually, if you have a perfectly healthy, slim young horse, it's very hard to give them laminitis with steroids. But you know, if you're already on the older side, a bit fat, a little bit of steroids can be enough just to tip you over the brink. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just have one question from the hospitalised perspective. Do you, how many of them would you say are sort of successful? And if they've got, if they're so bad, or I suppose it's secondary sometimes that they've got laminitis secondary to another issue in the hospital, but how many would you say typically go home and have some form of quality of life? Is it? Yeah, I'd like to tell you it's a majority, but that definitely wouldn't be the case. Um, no. I think um, we've had a, you know, number of cases this this year of mares that have had a retained placenta that have had laminitis and actually, you know, in all honesty, probably 60, 70 percent of them don't survive. Yeah. Um, but actually, you know, in less acute things, and I think that's exactly where the window is, that there is definitely a window of opportunity of treating these horses early on. Um, and, you know, the quicker you can get to them, the quicker you can do some of those preventative supportive things, the more likely they are to survive. Mm. And I, that's the key message, isn't it, which, um, you know, came across really, really well from both of your presentations. Thank you very much. And um, I think that's most all the questions and things. I'm conscious it's nine o'clock, so um, I'm sure you have some things to be doing. But thank you both of you so much for a really interesting, um, insightful presentations, as ever. Um, it's always a pleasure to, to do talks with you because I learn something new every time as, as well. So thank you very much for that. And I'm sure the depth of questions um, that everyone's had um, reflect you know, how engaging it's been. So thank you very much indeed.